and welcome to episode number 10 of CS350 Online. I'm your host as always, Leslie Eisted, and in today's episode we are going to continue our discussion of processes. Specifically, we're going to look at how those process management calls actually get uh, executed within the kernel. So that'll be a very exciting topic. If you're reading along with the textbook, this would be the system calls section. So anything related to system calls would be something you might be interested in reading. And again, I just want to stress that the textbook readings are not required. They're totally up to you. But if you want some extra information, it is a great source of extra information. The other thing I wanted to mention is that make sure you are using the most recent uh, version of the A1Q2 code, which is posted on Piazza. The other thing is that for the um, deadline for A1, please make sure that you read uh, Piazza because we've made uh, a few changes to account for the fact that the server <laughs> has been down for a little while and it's been a little difficult to actually do any work on it. All right, so let's look at our OS of the day then. Today's OS is called PIC, and PIC was kind of under development in 1965, and it was made by a company called TRW Inc. Um, the gentleman who actually wrote the code uh, for the PIC operating system, his uh, name is Dick PIC, um, and they named the operating system after him, which is very common, I want to say, with more recent operating systems to name it after its creator. Um, the commercial release was 1973. Now, this is an interesting operating system from the perspective of you've probably never heard of it, and yet this was Unix's major com source of competition in the 1980s. So it's like, here's this operating system that was actually a pretty big deal, but you've probably never even heard of it. Um, this operating system was monolithic, like Windows or the Linux kernel or Mac OS, but some of the interesting things about it are kind of interesting um, because a database, it's based on a database. So it has a hash based database system uh, built into the operating system's kernel so that you can quickly retrieve files and records and actually store things like records. Um, and yet at the same time, it also supported all the regular operating system features you would expect. So things like peripheral management, it supported multiple users, it had time shared concurrency, it had demand page virtual memory, which is a really modern idea of how you would actually implement virtual memory. And then it had a bunch of other database utilities as well. Things like it had a built-in query language, it had a built-in procedural languages, it could compile basic programming languages. It It's a very interesting um, way of doing things. And you might be thinking, well, who used this operating system? Obviously, this was not designed for the consumer. This kind of operating system was really designed for commercial applications. People who ran big companies and needed to keep track of inventories. And when we're talking about inventories, it's always so easy to think, oh, you mean like your actual stock. But employees are a part of your inventory too. So keeping track of employee records and so on, this is actually a, a decent way of doing it. Um, it's actually been ported to a large number of hardware. And what's really interesting about PIC is that it's actually still in use today, though not as an operating system. So what's interesting about PIC is that it's kind of ended the era where it was like its own operating system. And now it's just a database environment that you can run on top of like Windows. So still around, but not really in the same format. If you want to see some really amusing videos, so there, there's these conferences, things like I'm sure you've all heard of E3, which is the big gaming conference. Um, but there's this this old conference, and I don't know if it runs anymore. It's called Comdev, and um, <laughs> we'll go on YouTube and look up the old uh, Comdev. I don't know how to describe them <laughs> presentations. Um, let's just say there's some very very amusing ones with the PIC operating system uh, people. Uh, it usually involves, you know, music and dancing and things like that. <laughs> Except they change the words of the song, of course, to make it, you know, related to the operating system. But yeah, if you want to have some fun, look up the old Comdev videos. I might post some to Piazza just for fun because <laughs> they're very silly. And yes, it's not just PIC that participated in this. Like, there are Microsoft ones as well, and they are equally as silly. Um, I'll see if I can find some links and post them. 
All right, so where did we leave off yesterday? Again, I apologize, you can probably hear my fans on my laptop. It's not really gonna change. <laughs> So last class, we were talking about uh, processes and what a process is and how we actually create, destroy, and interact with the various processes in the system. So how do we manage our processes? So processes, remember, inside of the operating system is a lot of uh, textbooks are actually going to refer to it as just a, a program. But really, a process is the whole execution environment that the program is going to run with. So it's actually a structure in the operating system's kernel. And it usually includes things like a pointer to the address space. It includes a pointer to an array of threads that belong to that process. It contains things like a file descriptor table. Processes have unique identification numbers because we need to be able to tell one process from another in case we need to you know, terminate it or ask it if it's finished. We need some guaranteed way to actually identify, hey, this is the process you're talking about. So processes have all this information about them stored in a structure in the kernel. Now, if you're looking at the OS 161 implementation of a process structure, you'll notice that it's missing a lot of things. And that's because in assignment two, you're going to fill in all those lovely missing things. Now, we talked about creating a process. You do that with the fork function. And remember that fork, it creates a new process that is a clone of the parent. So it's a new process structure. It's a new address space and a new thread array. But the contents of the address space are the same as they are for the parent. So the child process, that's the one that you just created, inherits all of the stack values that the parent had. And then so that we can differentiate between the child and parent process in the code base, fork returns a different value for the parent and the child. The parent gets the child's PID as a return value from fork, and the child process gets zero returned from fork. And that's useful because we sometimes like to synchronize our processes. And you might be doing this because you might be a parent process that forks off a bunch of map working processes. And before you can fork off the reduce work processes, you need to make sure the map workers have actually completed their job. So you need to wait for those processes to terminate before you fork off the next ones. And things like wait PID are going to let us wait for processes which are our direct children to terminate. So that's kind of fun. And then we have a lot of different process management things. And OS 161 only has get PID, but there are many others for getting like your parents uh, ID, getting the user ID, changing the priority of the process, getting the usage and so on and so forth. So there's lots of different processes. All right. So we also looked at some examples. There's little spits of sample code in here. And we went through a few previous uh, midterm problems as well. There's a couple things I want to say. So threads don't really keep track of that parent-child relationship. We don't, we don't keep that going forward. But processes do keep track of that parent-child relationship. So for things like exec fee, where we aren't creating a new process, we're just changing the program the existing process is running. The parent-child relationship will not be destroyed through exec fee. The parent-child relationship is useful for things like wait PID, but here's some interesting behavior to think about. It's a bit morbid, warning in advance. Um, if a parent dies, what happens to the children? Do they terminate as well? Well, if you think about that in the real world, that doesn't make sense, right? If a parent dies, the children will be sad, but they go on living. And the same is true with processes. So if a parent dies, those child processes become orphans, but they go on living. Keep that in mind when you're working on assignment two, because you're going to be terminating processes and trying to manage weight PID. If a parent dies, don't kill the children. And the opposite is also true. If the child dies, the parent doesn't also die. These are individual process processes, but, and they do have relationships, but if one terminates, it doesn't impact the others in any way. 
All right. So just keep that in mind. Now the question we have is moving into our new topic for today. How do we actually implement these functions like fork, exec v, wait PID? They're obviously functions that the kernel needs to provide to the user program. But the realistically speaking, we, how do we want to do that? We really like to isolate the user from the kernel because we don't want the user programs to know anything about the underlying implementation of the kernel. And why would that be? Well, the reason for that's actually pretty simple. How many of you sitting at home have an apple? I'm going to guess and say that at least 35 to 40% of you have a MacBook of some kind. And you might have noticed that when you update, and Apple right now wants me to do an update. It's one of those things where I'm like, I'm not sure I want to do it. When you update it, some of your programs may stop running. Like when I updated from Catalina to Big Sur, a huge number of programs actually stopped working. And it wasn't like things you would expect. Like if I had some obscure thing like Stereo Photomaker, which is a bit of a piece of an obscure software, I should have anticipated that would stop working when I upgraded to Catalina because it was a 32-bit program. I didn't actually think Apple would get rid of 32-bit support. <laughs> they did. But that kind of gets to the point. When the operating system makes updates, do you want your programs to crash too? Because I know when I updated from Catalina to Big Sur, Zoom broke. I had to download and install a new copy of Zoom. OBS, which is what I used to stream to you, broke. I had to get that updated. And that is not the first time that an Apple update has broken OBS. It's like the third time since I started streaming. It's a regular occurrence. Adobe Reader broke. The number of mainstream tools that broke when the OS did an update was huge. And that's because there's a the kernel and the implementation of the operating system wasn't sufficiently abstracted from the user side of the world. They made so many changes to the operating system that a lot of software wasn't anticipating and they didn't continue to support that moving forward that it actually impacted the user program. The ideal approach is that the kernel of the operating system can be updated and it has zero impact to the user program. But the only way that you can do that is by keeping them isolated from each other. Now, that's what we're going to look at today. So the process management calls like fork uh, are actually a part of a bigger group of calls called system calls. And system calls are kind of part of the interface that exists between the user of land and the kernel. And these are things that you are familiar with and you use all the time. So there's the process ones that we've already talked about. And then there's all these ones with respect to files and directories. So opening a file, closing a file, reading and writing, making directories, traversing directories, all of those commands are going to be system calls. And they're called system calls because they are things that we want the system or the operating system to do on our behalf. The operating system has abstracted some behavior and is presenting it to the user in some nice way that they don't need to worry about the details, like opening a file or reading and writing from a file. You don't need to know the file system. You don't need to know anything about it. You just open the file, dump some bytes to it, and close it. And, and it's that simple. But actually, behind the scenes, it's not that simple, but you, didn't, you just didn't have to worry about it as a user. There's also stuff for inter-process communication and networking, so stuff like pipes. There's uh, managing virtual memory. So for example, if you run out of heap space, you can actually request more heap space or more stack space. There are magical system calls to do that. Things like rebooting your computer. That's not something you can do as a user. You need to ask the kernel to reboot for you. Getting the current time, you need to ask the kernel for that. That's information that it would have. But how do we do it? So we want to keep everything in user land completely isolated and separated from everything in the kernel land. Because I want to make sure that when the kernel gets changed, it doesn't have an impact on the user. So to do that, we're going to subdivide all of this code into two groups. We have the unprivileged code, which is user 
and we have the privileged code, which is the kernel. This is not just some high-level logical definition. This isn't something that everybody's just agreeing on. This distinction between unprivileged and privileged is actually a mode on your CPU. Your CPU understands this concept of layers of privilege. Now, we're only going to talk about two, privileged and unprivileged. But on the CPU that you have in front of you, there are at least four levels of privilege. You're probably only using two of them, uh, which is the, the lowest level, uh, most privileged, and the highest level, least privileged. unless you're running like some crazy hypervisor on your bare metal, it's probably all you're using. All right, so what's gonna happen then is the user application is going to call, let's say they wanna open a file to write to, they're gonna call a function in the system call library. And this is stuff like the standard C library. That's kind of what we're talking about here. And then somehow this, that library, the system call library, is going to be able to ask the kernel to do this job on its behalf. But here's the thing. This distinction between unprivileged and privileged code, it's not just a high-level distinction. This is actually something on your CPU. And unprivileged code, so when your CPU is in an unprivileged mode, you can't just call or access addresses in privileged areas. So somehow we need to have the system call library force the kernel to do something, but we can't call the kernel directly and we can't access its data structures directly. We need some way to trick the kernel into doing it for us without calling the function. It seems kind of like a weird thing, doesn't it? So this concept of privilege, it kind of extends beyond the ability to call kernel code. So effectively what it means is if the CPU is in an unprivileged state, then you can only access unprivileged things. So that means you can only access unprivileged regions of memory. You can only make function calls to that whose code actually lives in an unprivileged region. And if you actually tried to do something with memory in a privileged region, it would throw an exception, like it would throw an error, and, and you'd have to, the kernel, the operating system would have to deal with that. This also, by the way, means that there are some instructions on your CPU, excuse me, that can only be executed by the kernel. There are privileges associated with certain assembly instructions. So assembly instructions that you might use to adjust the voltage of your CPU would only be able to be executed during privilege mode because I don't want a user program to be able to directly adjust the voltage of my CPU. Now, if you're wondering why would you adjust the voltage of your CPU, uh, that's how you over or under clock. <laughs> um, well, it's one of the ways. If you find your computer is constantly overheating, the throttle down is usually let's just reduce how much voltage goes to the CPU. I used to have this Dell laptop back in like 2003, and it had serious overheating problems. It, they put a full Pentium 4 hyper-threaded processor in this thing, and they didn't understand how to cool it. And the heat destroyed the machine to the point where the only way you could install an operating system on it was to put the laptop in a fridge. I have photos of this. If somebody reminds me on Piazza, I'll actually post it. <laughs> But in order to use the computer after you installed the operating system, obviously you don't want to be using a computer in your fridge. That's ridiculous. But what we would do is we would reduce the voltage on the CPU to actually reduce how um, the, the how fast it was. And, and that actually kept the heat down reasonably well. That computer, if you're wondering whatever happened to it, it actually died in flames, like actual flames coming out of the keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't had a lot of luck with laptops in the past. Let's just say that. <laughs>
So privilege is going to not only designate which regions of memory we are permitted to access, but privilege also um, separates instructions as to you are permitted to use these ones and you're not permitted to use these ones. And if a user program tries to use something it's not allowed to do, then it's going to throw an, ex the CPU will throw an exception and the kernel will probably kill the user program or send a nasty gram or something like that. Now, there's some, uh, there's kind of a side chat to have here. So many of you may have heard of the Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities that were found on Intel chips a few years back. And I'm going to post the papers for those. And I know many of you may not be into security and hacking, but I actually, and you know, I don't have a background in security, but I found these papers very approachable. So I'd like to post them for you guys and you can read them if you'd like. They're kind of interesting. But what's interesting about how these vulner what these vulnerabilities were doing is you remember I talked to you uh, a couple episodes ago about how your CPU rearranges instructions. So when your CPU rearranges instructions, it kind of it disobeys privilege. <laughs> and it's entirely possible that in its rearranging of instructions, your CPU may access privileged memory and put that memory into the cache before we've actually officially made the switch to a privileged mode. And then when you try to, so it would load it, but when you go to use it, it would then validate that you have the correct uh, privilege to use the valid. But here's the thing, there is a period of time for which privileged data is living in the cache, but we are in an unprivileged state. And so what you can do is this timed cache attack to steal the privileged information from the cache. And that's kind of the idea behind Meltdown is um, you're able to bypass this privilege and access kernel data directly. So, oops. And uh, Intel, I think, has released patches for this sure they released patches pretty quickly actually um rumor has it that it actually slowed the intel chips down a fair bit in order to bypass this but i think they've overcome that since it's kind of cool actually you know sometimes i wonder if this is part of the reason why uh, amd has suddenly become super super popular this you know it's funny i've i've had intel chips and i've had amd chips over the last 25 30 years and you go through these waves where like one of them is super popular and then the other one is like non-existent. And then it kind of like, it goes back and forth. I know in the late nineties, early two thousands, the AMD chips were like, yeah, that's what you want to get because you'll pay less money and they actually are faster. And then I want to say from like 2003 until like a year or two ago, Intel was kind of the champion, but now AMD's back in, back in command again. I mean, they've got the Threadripper series, which are pretty amazing, but this new Ryzen 9 is just kicking the pants off everything right now, which is why they're bloody hard to get your hands on. <laughs> All right. So question on Twitch is how do programs interfere with privileged commands though if they cannot call directly? Um, so if you're talking about the, the meltdown vulnerabilities, um, I don't want to get into too great of details here, but if you read the paper, and I will post it, um, it talks about this thing called the cache attack and it's, it's using user code effectively to try to read the complete, con get the contents of the cache. You don't need any special privileged instructions to do it. Um, nothing like that. But if you're asking about, so how do user programs then, if they can't access anything, the kernel's privileged memory, how are they going to make the kernel do anything? That's what we're about to talk about. So if we can't call the kernel directly because, you know, the kernel's functions to open a file and read and write it live in kernel memory and we're in unprivileged mode, therefore we can't access that memory, then how do we ask the kernel to do anything? Well, as it turns out, there is a way to make kernel code run. You either fire an interrupt or an exception. Now, interrupts aren't going to be easy for you to do because interrupts are specifically uh, signals that are generated by your hardware, i.e. stuff like, um, you know, like a tablet. An interrupt is a signal that is sent from a piece of hardware to the CPU to say, hey, I need some attention. I've done something. So we're not going to be able to take advantage of interrupts, but interrupts do cause, if you remember, kernel code to run. <laughs> 
but we can't take advantage of exceptions. Exceptions, so interrupts were caused by devices. Exceptions are caused by code. So an exception would be raised if you tried to divide by zero. An exception get raised, and it causes, just like the interrupt handler, it's going to cause the kernel to execute an exception handler. So the only way that we are going to be able to ask the kernel to do anything is to raise an exception. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So here's a little note, though. It's an important note from, from this slide that I haven't mentioned so far. When an interrupt or exception gets raised, so when the CPU detects there's an interrupt, or when the CPU detects an exception, the kernel or the privilege of the CPU automatically changes. So the second the CPU receives an interrupt or the second the CPU recognizes the exception, the privilege mode of the CPU will go into the privileged or kernel mode. And at that point, the CPU can then call the interrupt or exception handler, which is in the kernel, and have it actually execute. So other examples of exceptions that are out there. So we already, I already mentioned division by zero, but arithmetic overflows. Um, an exception would be raised if you tried to execute an instruction that you didn't have permission to. For example, if you tried to power off the computer, but you were in user privilege, that wouldn't work. Um, page faults are another reason why you might have an exception. We'll talk more about those later. So how exceptions get handled by the CPU is actually pretty much identical to how the CPU handles interrupts. We are going to switch when we receive the exception, we are going to switch into a privilege mode and then ask the kernel to run an exception handler to figure out and deal with it. And this is what we're going to take advantage of to ask the kernel to do work for us. So in, all, in MIPS, there's something important to note. Everything in MIPS is an exception. So MIPS does not designate between, uh, doesn't differentiate between an interrupt and an exception. Everything is an exception. And there are various different exception types. And so MIPS, there is an exception type called EXIRQ. That's actually going to be an exception that is an interrupt, so from hardware. Now, IRQ, you may be like, why is IRQ the abbreviation of interrupt? I don't know. <laughs> um, it just always has been as long as I can remember. I mean, I could probably Google it. You can't use int, obviously, as the abbreviation, because if you used int, people would think integer. So they use IRQ, I guess. Um, so interrupts are exceptions on MIPS. And these are all of the different types of exceptions that MIPS actually supports. So these two here, uh, TLB miss on load and TLB miss on store. These two you're going to become very familiar with when you work on assignment two. And I will let you, I will tell you on um, Pialta how to deal with these two. We don't get regular segmentation faults <laughs> um, and you can't run Valgrind. So you're going to have to deal with these exceptions and, and learn how to interpret them. And I'll, I'll post some details about that shortly on Pialta. There's other things like uh, you've got a bad address. Uh, which is bus errors, um, and then we've got things like breakpoints, uh, illegal instruction, um, there's an arithmetic overflow. You see, you've got exceptions for different codes for different kinds of things. The one we are going to use is this one here, number eight, syscall. This is an exception specifically used to indicate to the kernel we want you to do something specific. I want you to open a file. I want you to fork a new process. We are going to raise an exception of this type to ask the kernel to do something. All right. So how do we actually do that then? Well, I'm going to open up OneNote here so I can type. I feel like maybe I should just use VI for this, but I don't know. Yeah, let's use VI. Like my 500th VI window open I have today. And yes, you're going to see like 300 errors populate my screen because latest Mac updates broke VI too. <laughs> Yay. 
waiting for a VI update. Okay, so let's say what, how are we going to raise this exception? Who is going to raise this exception to indicate that the user program wants to fork a new process? So the user program wants to fork new process. Okay, so they're going to call a function fork. And this function here is part of the system call library API, which is in user privilege. I can't spell. Really bad at spelling. Okay, so in the implementation of fork, which doesn't return void, what's going to be in here? In this implementation of fork, we need to raise a system call. Exception. There is a special instruction on each architecture for doing this, and in MIPS, it is syscall. Is that enough? Well, let's think about that. While you think about that, I'm going to answer this question on Twitch. So the question on Twitch is, are there specific reasons that syscalls are also called exceptions? That is just how MIPS has decided to do it. It's not to say that other architectures will refer to it in different ways. Um, Certainly, other architectures will do differentiate between interrupts and exceptions, and it's even possible that they consider a system call a separate thing as well. So it's really architectural specific, and in our architecture, everything is an exception. <laughs> so a system call is just a type of exception for us. All right. So back to this thought then about a system call. If I just raise the system call exception, how am I really telling the kernel what I want to do? All I've done is raised an exception. So the kernel will be like, okay, an exception was raised. I see that it's of type syscall. What did you want me to do? <laughs> it's, it's like a toddler coming up to you and knocking you on the shoulder. And then you're like, oh, yes, how can I help you, little one? And they just stare at you. <laughs> I have a two-year-old. They'll come over and they'll tug on your shirt. And you'll think, oh, they want something. They have nothing to say. <laughs> We need some way to communicate to the kernel what it is that we want it to do. And so there's this thing called the kernel's application binary interface, or ABI. And in the kernel's application binary interface, it tells us a bare minimum about how we can interact with the kernel. So it is going to tell us what all of the different system calls actually are and what parameters there are for those so that we can set them up correctly prior to raising the system call exception. So how do we do that? Where do we find it? You will find the kernel's ABI switch. trying to find a directory I want to be in. I've got so many things open. Okay. So right now I am in the OS161 kernel directory and I'm in include. And inside include there's a subdirectory called kern. So you should be in kern include kern. This is the kernel's ABI. This is information that is shared with the user programs so that they can actually ask the kernel to do things. This does not have data structures. This does not contain, uh, you know, the names of functions or anything like that. Let me show you what you would find in here. For example, in limits, we'll find stuff about the maximum file name length. It's important for a user program to know that. Uh, the maximum length of path. Uh, the maximum number of bytes that you can use for arguments, and so on and so forth. So this contains different little pieces of information to help the user program format themselves so that they can actually ask the kernel to do something. Another important one that is in here is Erno. Erno, I can spell. And in Erno, what we actually find is a mapping it's a bunch of macros for error codes. So for example, if we run out of memory, 
the kernel will return to the user program enomem. It's important that the user program knows what enomem is so that it knows how to give the error message back to the user program in a user-friendly way. So these error codes that the error might throw are very important for both the kernel to share with the user program, but the user program to have access to. And again, it's not sharing any information about data structures. It's not sharing names of functions or anything like that. This is information that is safe to share. So we've got the error codes. We also have error messages. So these are the recommended messages that go with each of those error codes. But what we are interested in for the purposes of raising system calls is syscall.h. And at syscall.h, it has assigned to each system call a unique call code number. So for example, sysfork is call code 0. execv is 2. Exit is three, wait PID is four, get PID is five, get PPID is six. Here are all of the call codes for users and groups, security, signals, pr other process functions that we don't have, things related to file handles, paths, mounting file systems, getting timestamps, security and permissions, sockets and networking, the time, rebooting, all of those system calls that OS161 or your OS is going to support are going to be listed in the syscall.h. These are all of the call codes. And what we need to do is we need to put the system call code in a specific register prior to calling, raising the syscall exception so that the kernel can look there and know, hey, you wanted to fork or hey, you wanted to call open. So let's go back to our little snippet here. We are going to set up the system call code. So we are going to load into register v0 the call code. And register v0 is where we would put this. And the call code would be look up in the syscall.h in the kernel application binary interface. Now you don't have to use load immediate, you can use load where there's all different ones you can use. Is that enough? It's enough for fork actually. But what if I wasn't forking? What if I wanted to open a file to write? There are arguments. I need to be able to tell the kernel the name of the file to write to. I need to tell the kernel that I want to write to this file, not just open it and create it. How am I going to tell the kernel that information? You tell the kernel that information by setting up some registers with the parameters. The parameters and which registers they go in are defined by the kernel's application binary inf interface. It's in that directory, kern include kern, to tell you what registers map to which parameters. And those arguments, those parameters, they go in to registers A0 to A3. Now you might be like, but that only gives me four arguments for any of my system calls. Is that a problem? It's not. Because if you need more registers for more arguments, then you shove all your stuff onto either the stack or the heap, and then through one of these through one of these registers, you pass the address to where the arguments can be found. That's it. And in fact, when we are working with exec v, which is going to take a null terminated array of string arguments, that's exactly what we're going to do. We are going to pass the address of the parameter array into one of these registers, and then we'll have to extract it from the user program's address space inside the kernel. Because remember, the kernel running in privileged mode has access to everything, and that includes unprivileged regions. But the opposite is not true. So that is how, in the user side, in the system call library, we would set up a call to the kernel by raising exceptions. We've already looked at that. Now, 
return values. We always think of functions as being only able to return a single value. But in this case, we actually need system calls to return multiple values from the kernel to the user. And the reason is that a system call function in the kernel might fail. And if it fails, we need to return to the user an error code so that they know why it failed. Now you might be like, okay, well then we'll use negative numbers for the error codes. So if we have a negative number, that means there was an error. And if it's a positive number, it succeeded. But that doesn't work because negative numbers might be perfectly valid responses from the kernel. So we have two return values. Into register A3, we're either going to put success or fail. Success is zero, fail is one for this. And then depending on the value in A3, register V0, which is our second return register, is going to either contain the value or the error code. So if A3 contains fail, then V0 will contain the error code. And the system call library, which initiated the system call exception, will look in both of these registers and then look up the appropriate error or exception to throw back to the user program. So a question on Twitch is, can I ask what would be the difference between calling through a, the ABI and calling the functions directly? So here's the thing. Using the kernel's application binary interface and raising the system call exception, you have no idea what the name of the function, the actual implementation is inside the kernel. You have no idea what that function looks like at all. Now, the kernel has to let you know what argument types it expects in what registers. So you have a rough idea of what the prototype for that function might be, but you don't know it, and you don't know where in privileged memory it actually lives because you've never seen it. The advantage of abstracting the code in this way is that the kernel can change its implementation significantly without really affecting the user program. Now, it can make updates to the kernel ABI, but you'll actually find that the kernel's ABI doesn't get updated that often. Um, that's kind of something that, that's going to stay the same. But we are separating access to the actual implementation. The user program wouldn't have access to it. Whereas in its current, if, if you were just to call the kernel code directly, you would have access to the location of where the function is, and you can kind of, you know, get privileged information you shouldn't have. Whereas using the ABI, it's completely abstracted from you. You don't even know, maybe there's like a chain of 10 functions hiding in there and you're not even gonna find out about them. So it's, it's a good way of abstracting the impl actual implementation away from the user. And you're actually not sharing anything other than I have a fork command and it takes these arguments. So it's the only thing you've told the user program, you've told them nothing else. Whereas if you do that without the kernel ABI, you're telling them the name of the function, you're telling them therefore the address of that function, and if I know the address of that function, I can poke around in the code elsewhere. It's not hiding things very well. So this is a good abstraction for both security and if you want to maintain the underlying operating system. All right, so things are going to look a lot different than using system calls. So what actually happens is the user application calls fork or open, and that is going to uh, actually be a system call library function, and it's going to actually set up the system call for you. So it's going to load the call code into register v0. It's going to load the arguments into registers a0 through a3, and then it raises the system call exception. When the system call exception gets raised on the CPU, the CPU immediately flips into privileged mode because now we have an exception and we need to deal with it. And we're going to call an exception handler that lives inside the kernel. And the CPU keeps this thing called a trap table where it actually contains the address of the generic interrupt handler and the address of the generic exception handler. Of course, in the case of MIPS, it only has an, an exception handler because everything's an exception. So our trap table only contains that, the address of the generic exception handler. 
Now, inside the generic exception handler, we're already in privileged mode, which is interesting. And the first thing that we are going to do is we are going to save the trap frame. Remember the trap frame, which is the context of whatever was happening prior to the interrupt or exception, so that we can return to it exactly after we are completed. So we save the trap frame, and then we look at the exception. And if it is of type system call, then we are actually going to look at the value in register V0 and figure out which system call you actually wanted. Once we figure out which system call you wanted, we will call the appropriate kernel function on your behalf. And that system call dispatcher will also set up the return values and error codes for any system calls. And then we'll return to the generic exception handler, which will restore the trap frame, change the privilege back to unprivileged mode, and then we go back to the library wrapper function, which is going to handle the error codes and return values and pass the correct return value back up to the user application. So it's a really long step. So something to think about, you know, you want to know why knowing about operating systems is important. You know, let's say you had to do this task where you had to print the numbers from one to a million onto a screen. So many people are so tempted, they're like, oh, we'll make a for loop from, you know, zero to less than a million and print I in the middle. And you're like, yeah, that's cool. That's, that's the best way to do it. Not really, though, because print is a system call, which means if you have n printfs, you have n system calls. But if you were instead to construct the complete string and then do a single print, that would be fewer system calls, which would be faster. Now, we're not talking about, you know, big O, little O, and things like that. We're changing the constant out front. <laughs> That's what we're doing. This is important stuff to think about you would be surprised at how much of your code actually involves system calls. So for example, if you're opening a file, system call. If you're writing to a file, each write is a system call. If you are reading from a file, that's a system call. Closing a file, that's a system call. If you are forking threads, if you are forking doing anything with processes, all of those things are system calls. It's kind of nuts. And here's another one, malloc. Malloc isn't always a system call, but it can be. So you should consider that most, of, if I'm writing code, I want to reduce the number of times I call malloc. Simply because the more times I call malloc, the higher the probability is that they're going to turn into system calls. So when you're trying to write efficient code, you have to look at it and ask, is there a chance this will be a system call? How could I reduce the number of system calls in general? That's a part of improving efficiency of code. And I know for a lot of you, this probably doesn't matter. But if you were trying to squeeze, you've got 60 frames per second and you want to squeeze it to 62, you have to start thinking about these things. How many system calls am I making? Because if I'm making extra system calls, that might be reducing my frame rate. I've actually worked on some programs where we couldn't trust the compiler to optimize correctly certain bits of code. So we would actually do certain parts of the code base in assembly so that the compiler would, <laughs> would do it the way we wanted to instead of rearranging it in a bad way. Eh, you squeeze a little extra performance out of things. You have to think about this stuff. Now, we could go through the slides here and talk about you know how this actually works, but I'd rather go through the code for this. But before I go through the code to actually show you how this executes in uh, OS161, there's one final thing we need to talk about. And that is the concept of stacks. So you know that every thread has its own stack, but what you probably didn't realize is all threads actually have two stacks in our OS. And here's the reason. So we keep one stack for a thread for user stack frames. So it's going to store anything related to the user program, the unprivileged stack. But when I switch into privileged mode, do you really want me putting stack frames from privileged data onto the unprivileged data stack? 
That doesn't make sense. That sounds like a potential for a security breach there, a big one. But here's the other problem. Stacks have a fixed size. And if you don't believe me, try to create a program where you put something giant on the stack. I like to make a, like an array of like big images, but make it like all static, like a like right on the stack. And uh, you'll find out that the stack, even in something like uh, Mac OS, or, or the, if you're using a Linux kernel, is only like one or two megs. What if the user program comes almost to the end of the user stack but never goes over? And then the kernel starts putting its own stack frames on, and then you get a stack overflow and the whole thing dies. The user program did nothing wrong. The kernel did it. The kernel was sticking its stack frames on a stack that was technically getting really full, but not a problem. So we want to separate things into two stacks. So the threads have a user stack, and the threads also have a kernel stack. And when the exception gets thrown and we switch into privilege mode, before we save the trap frame, we're actually going to switch to make sure that the current threads stack is going to be the kernel one. And so all of the kernel stack frames will go on the kernel stack. That way we are keeping the separation between user and privileged information. And that way the kernel isn't going to overflow the user stack. If the kernel overflows its own stack, then that's a problem with the kernel. But if the kernel overflows the user stack, that wasn't the user's fault. Why are you killing them? So we're going to keep them separate. All right. Now what I'd like to do is actually show you how this goes in OS 161. So we are back in our code base. And we are going to start with... We're not going to talk about the user side of things. It's already implemented for you, but I would like to talk about the kernel side of things. So we're going to go into kern arch mips low core. And in here you'll see a file that is .s. .s files are assembly called exception1.mips. And I'm going to go down to a function called common except Okay, I can't spell. <laughs> Oops. Scrolled past it there. Okay. Common exception is the exception handler that the CPU runs when it receives an exception. Remember, exception could be interrupt or actual exception. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to check the status to make sure that if we are in kernel what mode were we in previous to the exception and what mode are we in now? And that's because if we were in unprivileged mode and we're going into privileged mode, I need to find the kernel stack for the current thread and switch to it. If, however, we were in privileged mode and we threw an exception, then I don't need to find the stack for the current thread because we're already using the kernel stack for the current thread. So that's what we do. We check our statuses, and um, if we were coming from unprivileged mode, we're going to find the kernel stack for this thread and switch to it. We are also going to disable exceptions and interrupts. Turn them off. Why? Well, because I haven't handled the one I've got right now, and I don't know what it is. And I don't want to be bothered with another exception before I've even figured out this one. So let's turn them off temporarily until I figure out what this is. So we have the, we are in privileged mode, exceptions are off, and we're using the kernel stack. At that point, we save the trap frame. And this is actually the code for the trap, saving the trap frame. So you'll see here, we're just saving everything. It's like a big dump of all the registers and all the special registers to the stack, the kernel stack. And yes, this is saving some of the special registers like low and high and thing, yeah, everything. And then we're going to save some information related to the exception. Once we have actually done our save of the trap frame, we are going to prepare for and call the higher level generic exception handler. So that is called MIPS trap. And so we're jumping and linking MIPS trap. That is not in this file, it's a C file. So let's leave common exception and go into trap.c.
and we are going to go down to the function mips trap on line 126. This is what gets called after we've saved the trap frame. Now the trap frame was saved on the stack and we pass the address of that structure to mips trap because it contains all of the register values. And in some of those register values, we have information we want, like which system call is this? So interrupts are still off because we still don't know what this exception is. Now we are going to look at what kind of exception it is. If it is an IRQ, which means interrupt, we are going to keep exceptions off. When I am dealing with an interrupt from a device, I do not want to be interrupted because I want to handle it as quickly as possible and then return back to the user program as quickly as possible because an interrupt is temporarily like the the user program had nothing to do with this we have interrupted its normal execution for something else we want to be able to handle that something else and return to the user program as quickly as possible so we're going to leave interrupts off if it's an interrupt if however it is anything else we turn them back on because it's related to whatever the user program was doing so it's fine whatever we're cool with that then we're going to check, is it a system call? If it is a system call exception, we are going to call the system call dispatcher. And that function is going to handle figuring out which system call was it and how do we handle it. That is not in this file. By the way, the two files I have shown you so far, you do not need to modify MIPS trap and you do not need to modify common exception. So now we're going to go up one directory and we are going to go into the syscall directory. And that's in current arch MIPS syscall. And we are going to open syscall.h or syscall.c, sorry. All right. So this is the system called dispatcher. The first thing we're going to do is from our trap frame register v0. That's where we'll find our call code, so let's extract it. And then there's a big old switch in here, and my switch probably has more than yours does because I've been tinkering. And inside this switch, we switch on the call code. So if this is a reboot call code, we're going to call sysreboot. If this is the write call code, then we call syswrite, which is our implementation in the kernel of write. Same with exit, get PID, wait PID, and so on and so forth. This is where we discover which the exception has been, system call has been raised, and we call the appropriate handler, and we pass it the appropriate parameters from the trap frame. Now, this is another reason why, even though we know what parameters the kernel needs in order to execute wait PID, the kernel might need extra parameters to make that work. And if you look at this here, we've got our three register arguments for wait PID, but then this wait PID actually has a fourth one that's related to something in the kernel. We don't want the user program to know about that. That's a hidden piece of information that we might change in the future. So we have abstracted that by using this, this weird system call behavior. After the system calls have executed at the bottom of the system call uh, dispatcher, we set up the return values and error codes. They get set up in the return registers v0 and a3 so this is the failure want case here and then below we have the success case and then the very last thing that we do and this is kind of a weird one is we increment the program counter the reason why we increment the program counter is when the exception gets raised that part of the fetch execute cycle doesn't get doesn't happen so if we don't manually increment the program counter then when we return to the user program it's going to keep raising the system call we don't want that to happen. So we increment the program counter. Why do we increment it by four? Because the program counter is in bytes and to move to the next instruction, we need to move it four bytes. And then this will return to MIPS trap. MIPS trap, and again, is going to just return to common exception. At the very bottom of common exception, we restore all of the, the trap frame registers. And then we call RFE, which is return from exception, which is going to flip our stacks back. It's going to change our privilege back. 
and we're going to go back to executing our user program. It's a lot of work. That's why system calls are expensive. Avoid them if you can. <laughs> all right. So that is all the code that we have for doing this. And it's something that when you're working on assignment two, you're actually going to become quite familiar with because you are going to be adding all of the kernel implementation for fork, exit, wait PID, get PID, and exec fee. And that's assignment two. Don't worry, because on Tuesday of next week, which is after your assignment one is uh, due, we are going to spend the entire episode talking about how to implement A2. So if you haven't had a chance to look at A2, please take a look over the weekend so that on Tuesday you are prepared to ask questions and talk about it. All right. There's one last thing about processes we want to talk about, and that's the concept of multiprocessing. Multiprocessing or multitasking is really just the same as kind of multithreading. Remembering, of course, that processes don't really execute anything. It's threads that execute. And, of course, you can have threads from different processes lying around, and the CPU can choose between them. So processes are going to have their threads sharing the CPU. So when we do a context switch from thread A to thread B, those two threads may not necessarily be of the same process. Those two threads might actually be of two different processes. But it doesn't really impact anything. It just changes what curb proc is, right? So here's an example. And in this particular example, what's interesting is that there may be timer interrupts more frequently or at a smaller interval than the scheduling quantum common way of doing it, by the way. Or it might also be um, an issue of priorities. So um, process A may have more priority at first and then process B may get a few turns. So what you have happening is if you can only run one thread at a time, let's say a thread from process A is running and after each timer interrupt, since the quantum hasn't expired, process A will continue running. So it goes from user mode to kernel mode to check whether it needs to do a context switch. It doesn't, so it goes back into user mode. And finally, on the third timer interrupt, the quantum expires, so we do the context switch. The context switch is the same thing. It's thread yield, thread switch, switch frame switch inside the kernel. It's all kernel code. And then we're going to choose a thread from a different process to run. And now process A goes from running to ready and the thread also goes. So we're going to have process states as well. So processes can be ready, processes can be running, that is they have a thread that's running. They can be asleep. They can also be something called a zombie. We'll talk more about zombies on Tuesday. But a zombie means you still have the data structure in the kernel but you have no threads. So you're dead, you can't really run, but for some reason your structure is still alive. That's actually pretty useful and we'll talk about it on Tuesday. So the concept of multiprocessing is just a minor extension on what you know about threads. So what I'd like to do in the last few minutes is just give you an example of how multiple processes would interact with system calls and exceptions and so on um, using multiple processes and showing you what the stacks look like. So you've got the kernel running in privileged mode. And then you've got a bunch of processes. We're only going to use two. Um, and they're running in unprivileged mode. So let's say process A is running and its user code calls fork, which is a system call. And so on its user stack, you'll see a bunch of application stack frames and it calls fork. So that's going to call a system call library function. And so it's going to put the fork stack frame onto the user stack. And then the system call library function is going to set up and make the exception. So it is going to load 0 into register v0, and then it's going to raise the syscall exception. At that point, the exception gets raised. The CPU switches into privilege mode. We're going to find the kernel stack. We're going to switch to the kernel stack, and we're going to be executing common exception at the following address. So we are in kernel mode. We found our kernel stack. Now it's time to save the trap frame. So we save the trap frame. After we save the trap frame, we're going to call MIPS trap. So there's MIPS trap. 
MIPS trap realizes this is a system call. We can re-enable exceptions. And so we're going to call this and then call the system called dispatcher. In the system called dispatcher, we realize register v0 has fork. So we call sysfork. Now remember, exceptions are enabled, so the following can happen. A timer interrupt. <laughs> Okay, that's interesting. Let's see what happens. So if you get a timer interrupt and your quantum has expired, the CPU is already in privileged mode, so it doesn't need to switch. We'll start executing common exception and we'll realize we're already using the kernel stack, so we don't need to switch. But we still need to save the trap frame, so we're going to save the trap frame because we always, no matter what happens, if an interrupt or exception gets raised, you save the trap frame. Always. And then from trap frame, the interrupts go back off, by the way. And then we call MIPS trap. MIPS trap realizes this is a hardware interrupt. So we call main bus interrupt, which is like the dispatcher for interrupts. Main bus interrupt will call the interrupt handler for the clock. And then the clock interrupt handler will be like, hey, your scheduling quantum expired. We better do a context switch. So we call thread yield. Thread yield calls thread switch and thread switch called switch frame. And now we're going to choose a new thread and that new thread just happens to be a part of a different process. Doesn't change the stack code. Now there might be some little details like, oh, Kerproc is going from A to B. But the context switch of the thread is the same. So now we're going to, the switch frame is going to pop this switch frame off and we'll return from switch frame to thread switch to thread yield the interrupt handler will return for the new process. Main bus returns. MIPS trap returns. We restore the trap frame. And now we ha are going to return from the exception, switch back to the user stack, and switch back to user privilege, and process 2 would go about running again. Question on Twitch. What is main bus interrupt again? So main bus interrupt is kind of like a dispatcher for uh, the interrupt handler. So we're going to figure out which device caused it and uh, call the appropriate specific handler to that device based on based on which device actually threw the interrupt. So it's, it's, it's the dispatcher for interrupts. All right. So that's what would happen if you had a system call and a timer interrupt in the middle of it. If, however, we hadn't been interrupted by that nasty little timer, this is what would happen after sysfork gets called. So sysfork would return to the syscall dispatcher, which would set up our error codes and increase our program counter. It would then return to MIPS trap. MIPS trap would return to common exception, where the trap frame would be restored to this, uh, the CPU. And then we are going to call return from exception. So we're going to switch back to the user stack. We are going to switch our privilege back to unprivileged mode. And then we are going to go back to executing fork in the system call API. So we are back to user mode. Now we like to ask questions related to this on uh, quizzes and stuff. So please make sure you go through these and uh, kind of memorize things, okay? All right. One last thing to talk about, I think we've got a few minutes here, is to talk about interprocess communication. So if processes are isolated from each other and they're isolated from the kernel, what if two processes want to actually talk to each other? How do they do that? Actually, there's a lot of ways you can do this. So one of the things that you could do is you could have both processes reading and writing the same file. So you create a file called like communicate.txt and process A can write to it and process B can read from it. Now the processes are sharing information. It causes a little bit of a problem in, with synchronization because if you're trying to read while the other one's trying to write, you may get an incorrect value, uh, but it is one way that two processes can share information. And I've done this before. If I have, uh, and it usually happens, I have a proprietary piece of software with no API. So I have it dump all the values to a file and then I have um, 
which it does anyways. And then I have my process, my interpreter process, will be reading that file <laughs> and, um, and then sending it into the, the other system that I want it to, to, to do. Uh, that's a, a little trick to bypass uh, proprietary tools without APIs that you can build plugins for. Um, another thing that you can do is uh, the operating system often provides things like pipes or shared memory or a message passing queue. And these are all implemented by the kernel. So pipes and message passing, it's like a queue or data stream that the operating system is managing to let data go from one process to another. Shared memory is kind of an interesting one. It's like a part of an, your address space is also usable by the other process and you can both read and write to it, but you end up with synchronization problems. Now, the last trick you can use for uh, inter-process communication, which is actually what I prefer to do these days, is to use sockets. I use TCP sockets. Yeah, use networking. There are some advantages. Uh, one of those advantages is your two processes don't have to be on the same computer. Now you might be like, but why would I want two processes not on the same computer to talk to each other? I used this. Now, originally, I was doing IPC because I had the Vicon motion capture software and I wanted to take all of the our actors, you know, they were dancing and doing whatever they were doing. I wanted to take all of their position data and I wanted it to drive characters in real time in Unreal Tournament, Unreal Tournament 3. And um, back before Unreal spoke C in C++, back when you had to use Unreal script. Um, and so originally I used shared memory, but the problem was that I had to have the motion capture software running on the same machine as Unreal. And both of these are hugely intensive CPU and memory and GPU processes. So it really bogged the machine down. But then I got the idea, if we wanted to separate them out, why don't we use a network? Because then the motion capture data can come from anywhere and it can go to anywhere. And if you wanted to have multiple mocap systems driving Unreal from all around the world at the same time, you could do it. So in some ways, I like using sockets and networking for IPC because it gives you so much more flexibility um, in where those processes actually are. All right, so that's all we have for today. So in our next episode on Tuesday, we will be going over how to do assignment two. So do come prepared for that. And I hope you have a lovely weekend. We will see you next week.